Hello, and welcome to Lecture 6 of Semantics of Programming Languages. In, this, uh, in the previous lecture, we started talking about inductive proofs, and we saw how, uh, how structural induction worked and how it was related to ma uh, regular mathematical induction. And in this lecture, what we're going to do is we're going to talk uh, some more about inductive definitions um, and also... Uh, how how you can you formulate the principle of rule induction to talk about uh, talk about uh, proving things about uh, um, relations that are defined by systems of rules. So, for instance, if we want to prove facts about the L1 typing relation or the L1 reduction relation, so if we wanted to prove progress or type preservation, um, how would we do that? So in the last lecture, we talked about structural induction and how you can read off the principle of structural induction from BNF grammars that generate, uh, that generate families of terms. And in this lecture, what we're going to do is we're going to look at uh, how you can how uh, we can do an even fancier way of generating sets of trees, which are the typing rules. And what we're going to do is we're going to see how these, these arise, uh, properties about these can be proved using the principle of rule induction. And so if you look at some of our theorems, like progress or type preservation, you'll see something like, if uh, we know that E has the type T under the assumptions gamma and the domain of gamma is smaller than the domain of the runtime store S, then either the program E is a value or there exists uh, E prime and S prime such that the configuration E S can take a transition to the con configuration E prime S prime. And so the way you should read this theorem is it, like really this uh, this uh, typing derivation right here is the is the primary is the primary uh, precondition so we're saying if somehow we get a proof that e has type t under gamma that's our that's our primary hypothesis and what we want to do is we want to prove things about uh, about this uh, this kind of uh, typing relation. And similarly, for type, uh, type preservation, it's a little bit more complicated. We'll say, okay, if uh, E has the type T under gamma, and the domain of gamma is a subset of the domain of the real runtime store S, and we have a transition, E S takes a step to E prime S prime, then the thing you take a transition to is well typed and the domain of the updated store is still a subset uh, is still a superset of gamma and so now in both of these uh, in both of these theorems what we've got are some assumptions like e has the type t under gamma um, so we have that in both of them and in type preservation we have an additional uh, an additional relational fact that was established by typing rules we have e s takes this transition to e prime s prime and so the question is um, what do these transition relations like e s goes to e prime s prime what do they really mean because we can't prove things about the typing relation until we have like a clear sense of what what they are. Um, so in the previous in the previous few lectures, what I did was I drew some uh, I drew a conclusion and then over it I drew a line and then I drew some more things and I said, oh, imagine these are trees. And we're going to look at that once more. And we're going to try to tighten up our understanding of this idea of relations generated by trees um, to the point where we can formulate an inductive def uh, an inductive argument about it. And uh, so let's look at this reduction relation. And what we can do is we can, uh, we can look again at the rules that we saw. So, uh, so what we saw before was that we gave some rules where we said things like, OK, the op plus rule is n1 plus n2 and a state s transitions to n s. And, and when n is equal to n1 plus e2, n2. And we said op1 says that uh, e1 op e2 in a state s transitions to e1 prime op e2 s prime when e1 s transitions to e1 prime s prime. And 
you know, similar and similarly for the rest of the rules in the reduction relation. And then separately, we also specified a typing relation where we said things like, all right, E1 plus E2 has the type int, if E1 has the type int and E2 has the type int. And so the the thing that we're, we're sort of doing is we're, we're defining a relation, but there's there's something a little bit subtle going on because right here, when you look at one of these rules, say let's say E1 op E2, um, we're saying that for any E1 and any E2 and any E1 prime and any S prime, if we can find this transition, then the one below the line holds. So, so these these rules are actually talking about a whole family of programs. And what I want to do next is, what I would like to do is I would like to show how you can formalize this idea. So in the, in the jargon of logic, these typing rules are what are called schematic definitions. And that means that they're not talking about a single program, they're talking about a whole family of programs. So when you see, when you see uh, E1 plus E2, What's happening is that we're not restricting ourselves to a certain particular program like uh, bang bang L plus five. What we're talking about is any E1 and any E2. And so now what we have to think about is how do we connect this to um, you know specific programs? And so the way you should think about this is that these relations are just ordinary set theoretic definitions. They're ordinary relations, and we happen to be writing them in an infix relation. So for instance, for the transition relation, what we have is a set. So we have a set of L1 programs and stores, and L1 programs and stores. So this is a four tuple. And so what we're doing is we're saying that we're writing this this relation arrow as a subset of this huge set. So that's how you define relations, remember? So if you want to define a relation between uh, between between two sets, what you do is you take a subset of the of the Cartesian product of those two sets. Um, so let's uh, let's let's recall what you've seen in uh, in foundations of mathematics. So in foundations of mathematics, what you what you what you saw was that a relation uh, between two sets A and B. That's a set R, which is a uh, which is a subset of the Cartesian product, and so the idea is that. And, uh, and uh, uh, two elements, little a and little b, uh, are in the relation when they are in the subset. So, so this uh, this subset identifies part of this Cartesian product a times b, and so we can use membership in this subset to talk about a and b being related. So we're saying that uh, a and b are related just when the pair a b is in the relation. And over here what we're doing is we're saying that e s transitions to e prime s prime is a four place relation so we're writing e, instead of writing e s e prime s prime is in the transition relation we write e comma s transitions to e prime s prime and so we use this infix notation because this arrow sort of conveys the intuition to a human reader that E S is being transformed into E prime S prime. And so we're using an infix notation for the benefit of the human. Like there's no fundamental mathematical content to this. Um, like it's, it's, a, it's a convenience. And similarly, there's something similarly happening for the typing relation. So we're saying that um, A is 
is the set of all triples of type environments, L1 terms and types. And then we write this, uh, this relation, this typing relation as a mix fix relation. So we used arrow as an infix relation for, uh, for the transition relation. And for the typing relation, what we're really doing is we're writing it as a, as a mix fix ternary relation. So if you want, what you can do for the typing relation So if we think about this, you, we can think about these, each of these underscores here, like right here and right here and right here. These are sort of the positions in the relation and the, and the, uh, and the uh, typing relation that we're defining is a subset of 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 the of the set of triples type environment times l1 programs times type and so these these underscores i'm writing as the positions of this relation and then when you we write gamma uh, when we write gamma turnstile e colon t this is saying this means that uh, big gamma e t is in the typing relation it's in this uh, it's in this uh, subset of triples so we're writing this uh, relation in an infix way and again it's for the benefit of the of the human reader so we're saying uh, we're saying okay the term e has the type t and we're using the colon because that's a, a common notation for type annotations in programming languages and then we want to write e has the type t and we're going to say under the assumptions in gamma so the so the uh, turnstile is sort of separating the assumptions from the program and its type. And so this is, again, an infix notation that's been chosen to, to assist human readers. It doesn't have um, any, uh, any fundamental significance because the thing that it fundamentally is, is it's a ternary relation. Okay, so now we've learned how to read these relations as mathematical objects. So, <clears throat> so, so far I've been, I've been pointing at, so now the question is like, where do the trees come in? Because in the earlier lectures, I was saying over and over again, these relations are defining trees. And now I'm telling you these relations are just normal set theoretic relations. So what is going on? And so in order to understand that, what, what, what's, uh, what we need to do is we need to figure out how to relate these relations which are about specific concrete programs and specific concrete stores to the rules that we wrote where we have like these uh, these meta variables that stand in for a whole bunch of many different programs and so to understand that um, what we're going to do is we're going to say we're going to say well what each of our our rules are defining is a set of rule instances um, so you can imagine that when you write op plus, uh, there's many different insta instances of the uh, of the, of this rule of this uh, uh, of this rule. So here, this one says n one plus n two comma s goes to n s. And over here, you can see that for each store and each p pair of actual numbers, which satisfies this relation, that's an instance of the op plus rule. So, so now, so let's write op plus here. And so in the op a plus rule, what we had was What we had was that n1 plus n2 s goes to n s, and this happens when n is equal to n1 plus n2. 
And so that means that for each triple of natural numbers, n1, n2, and n, we're going to have a rule instance. So we're going to fill in this, uh, this rule right here. And so now what we can do is like 0 plus 2 goes to 2 because 2 is equal to 0 plus 2. Let's fix that. And we are also going to have, you know, 2 and 3 and 5 because 5 is equal to 2 plus, plus 3 and so on. And this will happen infinitely often. So one rule that we wrote with an uh, overbar and, uh, and an expression actually stands for an infinite set of rule instances. And so now the idea that so to to give a little bit of a to little give a little bit of a hint of where I'm going, um, what's what we're doing is we've do, we want to think about these typing rules as relating properties of concrete programs. And so this we're saying, I'm telling you, think about typing, think about uh, evaluation as being a relation on actual concrete programs. And the typing rules that we've written all have these schematic variables in them. So the question is, how do we connect this? Uh, how, do we, how do we understand what these uh, schematic variables mean? And the answer is that for each rule, we're constructing a set of rule instances, and we're saying, from this from this rule on lines one and two, which is schematic, we're going to construct the concrete instances. We're going to say, um, okay, for op plus, we're going to instantiate every n1 and n2 and n in such a way that it satisfies this side condition. And now we get an infinite set of concrete rule instances for this rule. Okay. And you can do the same for each of the other rules. So for instance, for the op1 rule, we can say, well, because 2 plus 2 goes to 4 has a concrete rule instance, um, we're able to show that 2 plus 2 plus 3 goes to 4 plus 3 has a concrete rule instance. And now the, the, uh, uh, the point is that we now have a, a an infinite set of actual concrete trees. And so we can build deriv concrete derivations, which is a finite tree where each step is a concrete rule instance. Okay, and so here, here's one example of this. And so now what we can do is we can say uh, 2 plus 2 plus 3 is greater than or equal to 5. It takes a transition to 4 plus 3 is greater than or equal to 5 in the empty store when 2 plus 2 plus 3 transitions to 4 plus 3 uh, in the empty store. And that happens when 2 plus 2 transitions to 4 in the empty store. And so now you can see that in this derivation tree, there are no meta variables at all. So, so now let me give you an example of something which is not concrete. So here is a non-concrete uh, derivation tree. And so before we had uh, 4 plus 3, uh, was it? No, it was 2 plus 2 plus 3. 2 plus 2 plus 3 we had was uh, greater than or equal to 5 in the empty store went to it went to uh, 4 plus 3 in the empty store. And so now what we can do is we can, you can certainly imagine writing it like this. So we have a, we have, we can say, well, that thing we compare it to, it could be a meta variable and you'll be able to build a derivation tree and it's going to be the same as the same as before. So what would, what will happen is that we're going to use the op uh, the op uh, op one rule here. Oops. And now what we're going to do is we're going to use another um, op one.
And now what we can do is we can finally use the op plus rule. And so you can see here that the first two rules, the first two steps are just concrete rule instances. And then we, we use the op one rule and we just wrote down a, a meta variable here. And so what this actually means is we're, we're really, we are really talking, this, this derivation stands in for an infinite set of concrete ones. So we can, we can make, we can give some examples. So, you know, we can make one, is greater than or equal to one. We can change this to, uh, to you know, bang L is a greater than or equal to dereference L, and so on. And so this uh, this derivation tree with meta variables in it stands for many different possible um, concrete derivation trees. So the idea is fundamentally that whenever you see one of these uh, one of these meta variables, um, that's a meta variable that can stand for any concrete term. And which one it is is sort of de determined by which grammar it is. So for instance, if we had changed this to S, now we can choose many different S's as, uh, as uh, instantiations of this meta variable. So for instance, we might have chosen like, L uh, goes to zero or something like this. So this, so this would be in a singleton heap, in a singleton store where L is mapped to zero. And so now we could instantiate N S in many different ways, either to the singleton or to the empty or to the one with a hundred million elements in it. It's all, it's all generated by, by just writing a single meta variable. Okay, and so now we we now we're starting to connect these two things. So what we did was we said, okay, we have all these rules, and we want to think about the typing relation as a relation between concrete programs and type environments and stores. And we have rules that have uh, meta variables like abstract things in them. And so now we're thinking about their rules and derivations as giving rise to whole families of concrete rule instances. And so our derivation tree is a finite tree where every step is a concrete rule instance. And now we can close the, we can close the loop. So now what we can say is that the relation, uh, let's say transition relation, which is a subset, uh, which is a subset of, um, you know, L1, which is a subset of a program and a store and another program and another store, this thing we can say this mathematical relation is defined as every ES E prime S prime such uh, where there is a there is a concrete derivation that uh, that ES goes to E prime S prime. And so this, this thing right here is how we connect the relational view of, a, of, of reduction or typing to the derivation trees that we're building. So our derivation trees um, with meta variables in them give rise to all of their concrete instances and the relational definition as a subset of pairs of, of, of terms and stores is just, is just when there's a concrete derivation um, of ES going to E prime S prime. And so that's how we're defining, we're, that's how we're defining this relation from the trees. And so what this leads to is the observation that for every, uh, for every, uh, element of the relation. So if someone tells you, if someone tells you that, oh, let's say that two plus three in the empty store, five empty store is in, 
is in this uh, four tuple. So if we know, if we are told, then we know for a fact there is a concrete derivation tree such that two plus three empty goes to five empty. So because we defined the uh, we defined the relation in this way with a membership in the relation being being given by the existence of a derivation tree that means that whenever we know that something is in the relation then we also know that there is an actual derivation tree corresponding to it and so what this means is that if we want to have a property about uh, about if we have a we have a relation and we want to prove some property about its elements then what we can do is we can prove this property, we can show that this property is closed under the rules. So if our property holds for every, every uh, so if, if, our, if we take a, a set of terms um, which satisfy this property, and then we show that applying the rules maintains the property, then um, the principle of rule induction says that, all right, everything you derive satisfies the property. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to show, we're trying to prove this property from the leaves down. Um, and so what we're going to, the, the idea behind our proof is we're going to say, okay, we have a concrete rule instance. A, like a concrete derivation of this tree of this uh, of this uh, um, of this uh, of this relation, and now we want to prove a property about all of these relations. So if we can show that the property holds at all the leaves, and then we can show that it's maintained by all the rule constructors, then it holds for everything. Um, so ah yeah, so here is a here is an example. Um, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit in the notes because I want to point this out. I want to explain this with an example before I move on. So, so let's look at this typing derivation and let's think about the progress relation, the, pro the, the progress theorem. So the progress theorem said that uh, if you have a, uh, a, a runtime store, which is... Uh, um, a subset of gamma and a term is well typed under gamma, then either it steps or it takes a value. So concretely, let's take a, let's take a, let's take our L. Our L is our, our store sigma is going to be L gets mapped to five, and our gamma is going to be L has the type uh, int ref. And now we ha we're going to have this derivation tree right here that uh, deref L plus two plus three has the type integer. And so now, recalling that uh, uh, recalling that L is in gamma, then then this is going to be well typed by the dereference rule. And the progress uh, theorem for deref L will hold will hold. Uh, obviously in this case. So it, the progress holds because deref L is not a value, so we have to show that it transitions. And so what we'll do is we'll say, well, L must be in big gamma, and big gamma must be a subset of the domain of the actual runtime store. So that means that L is in the domain of the runtime store S. So we know it can take a transition by the op deref rule. By the, by the deref rule for the reduction relation. So the property holds here. And now over here, two is a value, so progress holds for the, for the integer. And three, three is an integer, so progress holds is a value, so progress holds for it, too. Next, knowing that progress holds for uh, deref L and that it holds for two, can we show that deref L plus two holds? And the answer is yes, because we can use uh, the congruence rule for ops. So we know that uh, bang L plus two can take a step if bang L can take a step, and that's just what we got from this assumption about deref. 
And we can do the same thing down here. And once we know that bang L plus 2 can take a step, we can show that bang L plus 2 plus 3 can take a step. Because again, we can use the op1 rule, uh, which will say that this whole expression, bang L plus 2 plus 3 takes a step, because this bang L plus 2 takes a step. So the idea is that behind all of these theorems, all these proof techniques, is that if we can establish a property for all of the leaf constructors, and then show that the property holding for the, for the premises implies the property holding for the conclusion for each of the, uh, of the rules which are not non-leaf, then we know for any for any well typed uh, any program in the relation progress will hold and that's because if you have something in the typing relation so if you have so gamma v dash e, uh, et means there is a derivation tree uh, for for this and then our argument about working from our trees, well, working from the leaves down, means it has to hold. So, so that's that's the idea behind this argument. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to use, so the principle of rule induction is now saying, okay, so if you have a set of terms defined by a set of rules and you have some member of that set, then you can show a property holds about that member by assuming it holds for all the premises and showing it holds for the conclusion for each of the, each possible concrete rule instance. Okay. And so now what we can do when we prove progress is we can say, all right, we assume E has the gamma ET is well typed, or ET, E has the type T under gamma, and the domain of the, of the type environment is a subset of the runtime S, then either E is a value or it takes a step. And in this proof, we're going to take our property phi of ET as uh, this property which says, okay, for any store S, uh, if the if the type environment is smaller, a uh, domain is smaller than the runtime uh, store domain, it's either a value or it takes a transition. And then, just as we saw, uh, bef uh, th then we can uh, we can do rule induction by showing that this property holds for every single one of the rules. And so now. Remember that I said, well, we want to prove it for every concrete rule instance, and all of the rules we gave were schematic. How do we how do we square that circle? And so what you're going to see is that for every schematic variable in the rule, there's going to be a quantifier in the clause of rule induction. So if you if we want to prove say progress for the for the natural numbers, we had a uh, uh, we're, what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, for every gamma and every n, we'll show that the progress property holds for phi with the gamma n and int. And so these mathematical quantifiers are ranging over all of the concrete instances. So, so we wrote before that uh, that the that the typing derivation e has the type t. It was a subset. It would that we wrote that it was a subset of type environments and L1 programs and types. And so what we are doing in, with our quantification is we're saying, okay, for every concrete uh, type environment and every concrete numeral n, we want to show that this pro, uh, program uh, this property is satisfied, and we do that mathematically by quantifying over them. So the schematic variable in the uh, in the rule, we we deal with that in our proof by induction by introducing a quantifier. And so now, now the the whole recipe sort of finally comes into comes into view here. So we set up our typing relation um, schematically as a set of rules. 
all those schematic variables can be instantiated with concrete terms and concrete types and concrete type environments, concrete stores. And so that gives us an infinite set of derivation trees. And so we want to prove something about this infinite family of derivation trees by working from the, the root down. And so how do you prove something about an infinite set of trees? Well, we know all of these trees were generated by schematic rules. And so for each schematic rule, we can, we can prove something by quantification. So we'll say for op plus, for every big gamma and E1 and E2, what we're going to do is we're going to assume that the induction hypothesis holds for that E1, and we're going to assume that the induction hypothesis holds for that E2, and that we have the typing derivations, and then we will show that it holds for E1 plus E2. And so this will, this will go down bit by bit over the whole uh, Th this will sort of explain why you can start at any possible leaf, like any int is fine, and then you can work your way down, all the way down to uh, any possible tree, because we have done one of these uh, one of these proofs for every single uh, a typing rule, which is every single tree constructor, and so now we can we can have confidence that no matter which concrete derivation tree someone gives us, we can sort of pick this rule and that'll tell us what to do. And we can, we can, uh, we can show that the property holds um, for all trees. Okay, so that's how, that's how we do this. And so now, now that we've spent all this time talking about like these many different uh, induction properties, um, you can ask, well, okay, how do I know which one to use? And the answer is fundamentally, it's a matter of convenience because uh, all of these uh, induction principles are interchangeable. Like each one proves, proves the others. And the thing you want to choose is the one that matches the definitions that you're working with. So, um, you know, the, uh, the, the way to think about this, the way to understand this is really by example. So if you go and read the proofs of determinacy and progress and type preservation, you should read them and do the exercises and then you'll have like a really clear sense of how to, of how to do these, of how to, of how to do these uh, proofs by induction. And so now I've, I've said proof a lot and there are sort of, you know, three kinds of proofs. Um, there's a formal proof, which is a derivation in formal logic. And so it's going to be this big tree in natural deduction or sequent calculus or, uh, you know, Hilbert systems. Um, you'll, you'll learn about all of these things in the logic and proof class. And what you'll find when you, uh, when you do even small examples with these derivations in formal logic is that they're too verbose to uh, deal with by hand. So it's really understanding these systems is really good for understanding how to do a proof. But unfortunately, the trees in these systems are just too, un these formal proofs are just too unwieldy to do by hand. Um, how fortunately, however, you're in a computer science department. And a thing that uh, computer scientists often do is we say, well, whenever there is something that is too tedious for a human to deal with, we can get a computer to uh, to handle the bureaucracy for us. And so there's a uh, um, large number of computer scientists who work on machine checked proofs. In fact, I'm one of the, uh, one of these people. Um, and so these formal systems, like the ones you'll, you'll learn about in logic and proof, um, those are the basis of what are called proof assistants. And a proof assistant is basically a program which helps a human develop a formal proof. And at the end of it, you can push a button to check the proof that you wrote, and it'll tell you, yes, this proof works. Or more likely, it'll say, in this spot, this spot, and this spot, there's a, there's a gap in the proof. And frequently, the gap is of the form um, you know, you wanted to show that x plus y is equal to 5, and um, you've only proved that y plus x is equal to 5, and I, I'm afraid I can't take that leap without some guidance. Um, and um, that's obvious to a human, but not less obvious to a machine. So, you know, a, a machine has to be persuaded that this is true. Um, and if you take all the, uh, if you take one of these uh, formal proofs and you make everything obvious to a human, 
out, you take it out of the proof, you get an informal or rigorous, and but still rigorous proof. So the uh, the uh, the kind of proofs that mathematicians have been doing for 2,500 years are fundamentally arguments or uh, that are written for a human reader. So you're writing for the reader that you could write a formal proof if you were really forced to. Um, and you have to learn by practice to see when they're rigorous because when you're, because what is obvious me, uh, is not obvious. So for a professional mathematician who spent years working on something, many things are obvious which are not uh, obvious to uh, to a, a beginning mathematics student or even a mathematician working in a different area. And so you just have to learn by practice to see when these proofs are rigorous. And so this informal but rigorous proof is actually what you'll be what will be pushing you to do in this course. Um, and so the fact that the informal proofs are communications between human people means that clear structure matters. Um, you are when you write a proof, you are writing something for another human being to read, and it's not enough. Well, well it's necessary but not sufficient for you to write something that convinces yourself. Um, like when you yeah, you need to write something that will convince someone else. And so the idealized reader of a mathematical argument is someone who is um, maximally honest and maximally skeptical. So if you write a convincing argument, they will believe you, but until you give that argument, they won't believe you. And so that means that um, everything, ev everything non-trivial has to be spelled out, and it has to be spelled out in an organized way. Um, and often it will seem... Often the most difficult parts of a proof are the things which which seem obvious but actually aren't. Um, and so when you do these proofs, like for instance determinacy, you stare at the rules and you're like, obviously this thing, this program is determinist, this, this language is deterministic. Uh, but the, determinacy, the, the determinacy proof is the thing that lets you see why it's obvious. And sometimes obvious facts are false. And sometimes the obvious facts are not obvious. Um, and so the, uh, the, the, the thing you really need to do is when you're writing, when you're writing a proof uh, about a type system, it will be very, very tempting to say, well, this bit is hard because there's a little gap and getting from from A to A prime is like really clear that it should be true, but I don't know how to do it. And that's usually a sign that you need to do a proof. So like there's a bunch of these lemmas, like inversion lemmas, which are arise from the structure of the type system and they embody the obvious facts that you that you want to use when you're making an argument. And an additional reason for uh, for doing these proofs is that the proof will often suggest the algorithm that you need. Um, so if you want to show that type inference is decidable, you can look at the proof of uh, of the of the uh, um, checking and that'll show you how information is flowing through the proof. So you look at where the quantifiers are and how they get instantiated, and you can look at that, and that will help you figure out what your algorithm has to do. Okay, so like here's an example of an obvious lemma, um, and that you that you none th that nonetheless has to be proved. So this says that you know for if you have a derivation uh, that e has the type t, and you know that e is a value and t is an int, then there is then e is actually an, a concrete integer for some for some for some n integer n. And how do you prove that? And the way you prove that is by by looking at each of uh, by is by doing a proof uh, by. Well, you could call it induction, but it's really a case analysis. You look at every single one of the rules, and you see that if t can be an integer, say an if then else or an addition operation, then it's not a value. And the only and if it is a value, the only values that have type int are the natural numbers. And so that this this kind of lemma lets you fill in that gap. But you but you prove it by looking at every single typing rule. And 
Now, when you have these when you have these things in hand, what you can do is you can prove things like proving progress. So what you can do is <coughs> you can show that if E has the type T and the domain of the type environment is a subtype of the domain of the runtime store, then either is E is a value or it can take a step. And we'll take our uh, we'll take the property that we're satisfying to be for every uh, for every store S with satisfying it, which is a superset whose domain is a superset of gamma, then either E is a value or it takes a, or the configuration takes a step. And we're going to show this by rule induction on the derivation of gamma. And the way that we'll do this is we will instantiate we will we'll look at each of these rules and we'll see that um, there's going to be sort of one proof obligation corresponding to each of the rule constructors. And so this will let us, and whenever we have a schematic rule, we'll introduce quantifiers to range over those schematic variables. And then we'll, we'll, be, we'll try to show that if, um, for instance, in the op case, if, if uh, progress holds for E1 and progress holds for E2, then progress will hold for E1 plus E2, all three of these at the type int. Um, and that will, give us, that will give us a set of proof goals that we have to show, and these will correspond one for one to the rules in the, in the type system. And so let's look at one specific case of this. Let's look at the op plus rule. So in the op plus rule, what we want to do is we want to show, let's look at op plus, it's going to say for any gamma, for any E1 and any E2. Uh, and whenever you see a, whenever we want, we want to prove this and we want to do prove this by assuming we have an arbitrary gamma E1 and E2. And now we're going to assume that once we have these things, we have progress for E1, we have progress for E2, and we have the derivation trees for E1 and E2. And what we want to do is we want to show that progress holds for E1 plus E2. And so now, since the progress property for E1 plus E2 is a universally quantified formula, what we're going to do is we're going to assume we have an arbitrary S whose domain is a superset of the domain of this of this gamma and because e1 plus e2 is not a value that means we can't prove this we have to prove that there is a transition we can take and so the way that we'll do this now is we will turn to we will, can look at the rule, reduction rules and we'll see that there is uh, that depending on whether E1 is a value and E2 is a value, we'll end up with four different cases. So either E1 is a value or E1 transitions. And then we'll, we also have E2 is a value or e, E2 transitions. And that will give you a set of, of cases. So if E1 reduces, then E1 plus E2 will reduce using op1. And if E1 is a value but E2 reduces, then E1 plus E2 will reduce using op2. And if both E1 and E2 are values, we want to use the op plus rule, but we can't yet. And the reason is all we know is that E1 and E2 are values of type int. And so now we can turn to this lemma, which says, well, if you have a value of type int, then it has to be a numeral. And so, what we that we have these typing deriva derivations by our rule induction principle and so now what we get is that e1 is some natural number n1 and e2 is some other natural number n2 and so now because addition is a total function we know there is some some sum of these two numbers and we can get the reduction using the op plus rule okay and so all the other cases of this uh, of this proof are in the notes and so the, the thing I want to emphasize is that the even though all of these reduction rules are are uh, uh, all sorry all of these induction you know we have a, a zoo of induction principles it's uh, which one we use is sort of chosen by uh, by what is what is convenient for doing the proof like 
they're on like all the different induction principles can be shown to be equivalent for to each other. And so for determinacy, we can use structural induction on a term. For progress, we can use real, real induction on the typing derivation. For type preservation, um, it turns out to be convenient to do it by real induction on the uh, reduction relation and so on and so on and so on. And the fundamental thing to understand is that the the core idea is not a very complicated one. We're imagining that a property is uh, established, that, a re that membership in a relation is established by exhibiting a derivation tree for it. And if you can show that working from the leaves down, you can get to the uh, you can get to the uh, get to the root of the tree, then you have proved it for all. Uh, you've proved the property for the whole relation, and that's really the the fundamental idea. And there's just a number of steps that have to get that we have to deploy in order to get us into a position where we can deploy this uh, this basic idea. Um, and that's the end of this lecture. And in the next lecture, we'll start looking at how we can start extending L1 to become a richer programming language that's more like the ones that you actually use. So we'll start by looking at functions. Okay, so thank you very much.